Bachelor class of 2020. I'm Prudence Wilson. I'm a previous year 12 student from 2019 uh, and I'm currently studying a Bachelor of Languages and Linguistics at La Trobe University. Now when I heard about the whole COVID situation with you guys having to stay home and do year 12 um, kind of by yourselves without peer support, I thought that was really tough because um, I'm fresh out of year 12 and I know what it's like. So I thought, how can I help? So I've contacted Mr. Simons and I'm making a, I suppose, short video on a few key things um, about uh, this week, register and politeness. Um, and I'll make a few more on social purpose um, and identity. And yeah, I really hope it helps. Now I want to disclaimer that I'm absolutely no expert on these topics. I've simply um, studied them a little bit more and I um, and I really wanted to share that with you. So without further ado, let's start. What is register? So by now into formal language, you guys already have a fair idea of what register is. Just formality, kind of a way that you, um, I say analyze a text um, on a continuum of formality um, and that's the most important part I think about register that it's on a continuum you'll never have a purely um, formal text or a purely informal text they're always going to have a little bit of both just um, because they work really well together when um, getting across someone's point of view. For example, a little bit of informality might close the social distance while a little bit of formality makes them look good and makes them know what they are talking about and then um, say if that was for like an ad then that they're more likely to buy those things because it's like oh they're friendly but hey they also know their stuff so that's kind of an example of how um, how along the continuum formality and informality work really well together. So what modes of language tend to be more formal? Um, of course, written language always tends to be more formal um, as well. Um, so like essays and uh, scientific papers, whereas spoken language tends to be more informal. However, there's always some exceptions. So for example, a play might be more in a more formal yet it's spoken um, and then texting which is written might be informal and it has a lot of um, characteristics shared with um, spoken language so slang abbreviations things like that um, and then lastly what are some things that an author or a speaker might be trying to achieve with increased formality so that's uh, things like social distance they might use uh, formality to say, well, back off, we're not that close. Um, and also, they might use formality to be polite, so politeness. And that's what I'm going to touch on next. So, what are some components of politeness? So, of course, uh, we have negative face and positive face. Uh, but we also have some... Across, across different cultures, not necessarily always in Australia and Western societies, but across other cultures, there can be some aspects of politeness that are paralinguistic. So we're going to dive a little bit into that. But firstly, let's touch on negative face and positive face. So negative face is about how much you're imposing, I suppose, on that person's effort. How much effort that the person that you're talking to will have to give out depending on what you're requesting them to do or depending on what you say to them. Uh, whereas positive face is more about someone's ego. They want to look good and if you say anything against that, uh, you're not adhering to positive face. Um, then we have um, paralinguistic politeness. So this is things like um, in Japan, they might bow or um, they hand things, uh, hand things to people with like the right way up so that the person that is getting it um, can already start reading it as it's being handed to them. That's a big thing um, in, in Japan that's polite. 
Um, so is uh, taking your shoes off as soon as you enter the house and putting on some slippers that your host might have given you. Um, that's a kind of paralinguistic things that are uh, in some way body language, like, like a paralinguistic form of politeness. Um, the next thing is just something little that I wanted to share with you. Um, I'm learning it at university at the moment that is uh, fairly relevant to politeness. Now, this is kind of just a theory, but they are Grice's cooperative uh, maxims. So this term cooperative means there'll be like two interlocutors or, or more, two or more interlocutors. And um, it means how well are people cooperating in the conversation to um, avoid, I suppose, not adhering um, to negative and um, positive face. So the first one we have is quantity. So that's like how much talk is too much talk in a specific context. For example, if I'm sitting in the back of a courtroom um, and I'm chat chat chatting away to my friend, that's not really the appropriate place to be talking loudly to your best friend. So in that case, it's not polite um, to talk a whole lot. Whether there might be stances where it's totally fine and you want to talk heaps sitting in your bedroom with your best friend. Talking and talking and talking, that's totally fine. Um, and that kind of gives into turn taking as well. Like, don't don't always be the one talking kind of thing. Um, let someone else have a go. Then there's relevance. Um, the cooperative maxim of relevance is talking about if someone was like, hey, um... I walked my dog today and the other person was to answer I work in the city well there's no like there's no relevance at all between what the person said um, and what the second interlocutor answered um, and then that way it's not polite like you want to keep on topic or have like a really nice uh, semantic flow in what you're saying um, and how the conversation goes um, the maximum of manner so that's talking about um, how, how you say things so that they're really clear. If someone's umming and ahhing and stopping in the middle of words um, or just explaining things in a really obscure way that the person uh, doesn't understand on the other side, then that's not adhering to the maxim of manner because the other person is going to get really, really confused. So that's just making sure that what you're saying is really, really clear. Uh, and the last one is quality. So that's how truthful, um, how truthful what you're saying is. So it's kind of playing on that thing that always telling the truth is super polite. Um, however, there is some problems with that. For example, if you're pulling a face and the person you were talking to were to say, oh, what's the face for? And you were to tell them, well, I really hate that dress on you. It makes you look really, really fat. In that case, telling the truth isn't exactly the most polite thing to do. So there's a bit of um, hypocrisy in that. Um, hence my little picture there. All right. Now, I have a quick five minute task. Now, first of all, the first one we kind of covered, but I want you to think of maybe another um, of the four maxims that aren't always polite. And then the second one, I want you to give an example of a sent sentence that imposes on both the speaker's negative face and the listener's positive face. Um, my example here is, help me clean the kitchen. So in that case, it's kind of like you're imposing on the speaker, uh, on, sorry, on the listener's, I, I've written that wrong, on the listener's negative face. Um because you're asking them to do something and they therefore have to exude a little bit of effort to do something. But um, you're also uh, not adhering to your own positive face because you're saying, hey, I'm incapable of cleaning the kitchen alone and therefore you look a little bit worse. So that's all, good luck. Um, I'll also be covering social purpose and identity, so... Good luck.